Welcome to today's webinar. Stability testing is presented by Dr. Thomas C. Kubik, President and CEO of ARL Biopharma. Dr. Kubik has 30 plus years of experience in pharmaceutical sciences and forensic toxicology. He also serves as a graduate faculty member of the OU Health Sciences Center and has held teaching appointments at several universities. Today's webinar is accredited through ACPE and is worth one CE contact hour. CE credit is applied following completion of an evaluation link found on the last slide in the presentation handout. You can find this handout on the lower portion of the GoToWebinar toolbox under handouts. We are recording this session and will include the recording, slides, and evaluation link in a follow-up email. Questions may be submitted throughout the webinar using the GoToWebinar toolbox on the right side of your screen under the Questions tab. We will answer the questions submitted following the presentation. If we do not get to your question today, a list of questions and answers will be emailed to all attendees following the webinar. Thank you for joining today's session. Well, good day to everyone. Uh, it's exciting to present this very prevalent and relevant topic uh, in the compounding uh, community today. And so we'll be discussing both the science and the uh, compliance portion of it. As Ms. Dean indicated, you're, this is approved for one contact hour. The objectives we're going over is we're going to look at both at some of the regulatory guidelines uh, of this for stability testing from different perspectives, actually both from the state and the federal will be discussed. And both USP and, and, and the FDA perspective. Uh, we're going to look at some really, I'll be focusing more heavily on the context of the science of a stability indicating method, and we're really going to dive down, drive, uh, dive down into some of the granularity of the science of stability and some of the thoughts and ideas that should have, one should consider when conducting a stability study. Uh, we're going to look at factors that affect the stability. And then we're also going to look at some practical examples and applications for the 503A and 503B. This, uh, if you've seen this before, I've given this talk previously, and I really think that this diagram illustrates the thought process I had when we were putting together this talk, that when you have the science, which should be evidence-based, combined with the regulatory or the compliance aspect of it, you have an ideal world, but ultimately you would like to have a science, scientific or evidence-based uh, stability study combined with the compliance or regulatory to meet that ideal conditions uh, for your systems are quality and in control to ensure that you're delivering a safe and effective product to that patient, which is the ultimate goal. I start with this first definition. I think this is one of my favorite definitions of stability because it really tells what what it what do we mean by stability uh, and it's really talking about the extent to which a product retains within its specified limits and throughout its period of storage and use the same products or characteristics that it possessed at the time of the compounding so essentially you want it to maintain those same properties whether it be physical chemical microbiological throughout its entire process at which the time is the other definition, which is in 795, it says the date after which compounded preparation shall not be used, determined from the date the preparation is compounded. So essentially, it's just telling you, hey, don't use this substance after this date. But I like the prior one because you're really looking more at the science of the product. And we'll be discussing that in detail in today's discussion. <laughs> this is also a good overview slide. Uh, for presenting some of the regulatory and guidance documents. You see the, the stability is not a, a new concept by any means to the testing or the uh, dating of pharmaceuticals, whether it be compounded or commercially prepared. ICH uh, is the International uh, Council for Harmonization, and that's really a, a global entity that is responsible for putting together data regulations. And it's, it's a nice that it pulls, that combines the regulatory and the technical aspects. And you can see some of those and I'll highlight a few. But I think this serves as a good basis from a regulatory reference database that can start here. And so 
if you're really interested and you want to have these documents, we can provide them for, to you or you can look them up. But these are some good, well-rounded, scientific cited references at that International uh, Council of Harmonization that they provided. And then, the, of course, the FDA, the uh, Food and Drug Administration. And I, I, I selected uh, the areas that I think are prevalent in relationship to stability. So this, by all means, is not a conclusive references for compounding, but the focus of, of this is stability references from a regulatory perspective using the FDA. And then finally, the, the chapters in the USP, which a lot of discussion has been around those in more recent years, both the 797 and 795. And I'll pull out a few of those. So in that ICH, I think that Q1A, really it talks about the stability testing of the new drug substances and the products. There's even clear guidance on the validation of the analytical procedures. And then, of course, the testing procedures and the criteria for those drug substances and the drug products. And even the test procedures for uh, biotechnology and biological products. So I included that Q6B because in recent years, you're seeing a greater emphasis in bio, biologics, biosimilars, proteins, peptides, uh, drugs that are being looked at outside the conventional small molecule. Here's one that I thought was an important one that ICH 1.2.2 taken from the Q2, and that's talking about specificity. And you'll see there's a trend or a thread that's going through some of these slides initially. And I'm talking about specificity, which should include the stress conditions. And here they mention light, heat, humidity, acid base, hydrolysis, or even oxidation. The FDA, all of the, many of these citations will have clear documentation regarding stability studies and what a method should include. There's a, a validation for chromatographic methods. That there's a document that's been put out by Cedar for many decades. It's often referred to as also a good historical document. Also, the FDA guidance for industry on the analytical procedures and methods validations, they've made it very clear in the stressing the studies. And there's been some good talks and, and, and uh, seminars presented on stability studies in the last couple of years by many institutions as well as the uh, USP and, and other. But this uh, one particular guidance document is talking about a stress study should again, should include stressing the, of the products for acid base hydrolysis, thermal or heat, and then the light, which is the pyrolysis or oxidation for the, both the drug substance and for the active ingredient in the drug product should be provided to demonstrate the specificity of that assay for the procedure for also for impurities. Bottom line, do not interfere with the quantitation of the active ingredient. Again, some guidance document. It's, it's, so you'll see this throughout. So I just pulled out a few uh, references, particularly to stability studies regarding drug substance and drug product. This particular one is the stress helps you determine the intrinsic stability characteristics to validate the stability indicating power. And what do I mean by this intrinsic stability characteristics? People often ask, why do you want to test or why do we have to do acid base, heat peroxide, and UV? The idea is you may not know the mechanism at which that chemical entity or that drug substance is going to degrade. So by selecting all five of those mechanisms, most likely it's going to degrade utilizing one of those. And I'll give several examples of that. So if you know based upon the literature, that's great. But regardless, one needs to conduct all of those stressors or the degradation process for stability indicating method. And so that was that's, well, that will be driven home today in this uh, presentation. Again, the CEDAR, which is, if that's been around this particular document, it talks about specificity or selectivity. The analyte should have no interference and it should be free from other extraneous components and well resolved. And we, what we mean by well resolved is those chromatographic peaks are separated between the degradant and the the, the compound of interest or often the chemical substance, the active chemical substance. USP, these are a few of the chapters that are listed in few, uh, USP regarding stability. This is not exhaustive, but this is a few that I thought was really pertinent and it would be good to look at and read. 
uh, injectables, of course, parentals, it, it's a really good uh, chapter. 795, 797, we know a tremendous amount of energy and resources have been devoted to that, even with the proposed changes. A lot of discussion has been going on in the compounding community and others regarding these two chapters. The dosage forms, I don't think, should be uh, excluded because dosage forms definitely affect the stability of it, as we'll discuss uh, later today. Of course, the quality assurance cannot be ignored in Chapter 1163, and then the basic chapter of stability considerations of 1191, and then actually validation of the compendial procedures are listed in 1225. So that's just, again, the basic. And of course, I picked out the 1225, and it's again talking about the light, heat, humidity, humidity acid base, and oxidation. So all of these, both USP, both FDA and ICH has listed and given good guidance regarding stability indicating methods for decades. Okay, let's focus on the compounding. What is the difference between compounding and manufacturers? We, we know this from, from years. Of course, the, the traditional definition of uh, patient, uh, physician, pharmacist triad. We know that the compounded products are extemporaneously prepared and not commercially available whereas the manufactured drug products are commercially prepared. You know, I think the, the regulatory guidance for CGMP is different than the regulatory guidance for compounders. And so today I'd like to try to shed some light on some of the differences and, and point to that, because that's a common question that, that we often encounter. Uh, but this, these guidances for the CGMP, uh, good manufacturing processes, have been developed over years and years of industrial experience, and they're enforced by the United States, by the FDA, um, based upon the, the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act. You know, this change with data supports it or new technology is developed, and it is applies to all medicines and some equipment that is actually commercially available. Another important guidance or regulatory document is the 21 CFR Part 211. This is a very important primary standard for preparing, testing, and release of that, of your drug product or drug uh, compounded preparation. In general, uh, it's general enough to give some firm, uh, to give firms the flexibility to set up their own production, testing, and monitoring methods. The caveat is, to it is it carries the responsibility to follow those methods. So there's clear guidance in that part uh, 211, 21 CFR part 211. Okay, this, the, the, the crust of this talk today is really the science, and it's uh, you, often it's sort of this, I like this particular diagram because it's like it goes in a spaghetti and hopefully it comes out in a controlled, some form of an orderly fashion, and so that's the guide, the goal that I like to ha present today is looking more of this, the science, and then how does that uh, pigtail into the, um, some of the regulatory or what's going on in, in the community today. You know, we often think of stability as maybe microbiological or chemical, and we think of that from the risk-based assessment. But really, stability includes five areas, and most, so we'll talk tremendously today about chemical testing. But physical is extremely important, as you see in the different dosage forms. The microbiological, which tremendous amount of decisions have been based upon that regarding the risk and risk assessment of it, which it should be, but also one cannot operate in a vacuum without considering the other variables of stability. And then these last two, which are very important, is therapeutic. It's important that the drug is stable throughout and therapeutic, meaning it's effective, because the ultimate goal of that compounded product is that it's safe and it's effective for which it's intended in it when it's delivered to that patient. And then toxicological aspects. I think there are some degradants when substances degrade over time that could be toxic. That is an often uh, not really discussed uh, concept regarding stability, but it is listed in USP Chapter 1191. It is a consideration from the FDA, both uh, in drug submission. So I wanted to include all of those out, but of course, we'll be focusing on the first three here listed today. Okay, well, let's look at the chemical properties. What do we mean by the products containing a drug? Essentially, you're looking at what is the drug concentration of that active uh, pharmaceutical ingredient or substance in that particular final dosage form. That's referred to as potency. I think I, I like to call it the concentration of the drug of interest that you're trying to quantitate. 
<clears throat> its potency. Another item that we have cannot ignore is preservative for preserved products is that preservative stability. That has to be tested and we'll give examples and we'll discuss that later on as well. And then even in aqueous solutions or suspensions, the importance of pH. We're seeing when often a stability study fails, there's something going on in the formulation that affects either the solubility, the, you know, the precipitation. I mean, many, it's really, I think, a pharmaceutics that's driving a lot of the stability of that compounded preparation. So these are some of the basic things and terms that are, are discussed or looked at during a stability study. Okay, obviously that we're, you're going to look at the appearance and you think, well, what's that going to change? I can remember a, a study of morphine that was conducted and published in the uh, Journal of Pain and Symptom Management about 20 years ago, where we were looking at morphine in a, in a parental pump, an implantable pump, and it actually changed colors to a, a yellow. When I uh, consulted with Larry Trissel regarding that, he said, well, that's Tom, that's been published back in the 60s, and sure enough, it had. So. It's amazing, a lot of the data and information is published if you do a thorough um, a search in, your, in, in the uh, library or in your databases. But another important physical property that's, that, should, that we're looking at and seeing a lot of interest in is the particulate matter, particularly those ophthalmic solutions and other ejectables. So that particular matter is a very important issue. And then finally, the microbiological properties. Of course, the sterility, uh, for sterile injectables, uh, we often you need to look at the, also the endotoxins. We need to consider the container closure integrity. That's very important, and we'll discuss that also uh, today's discussion. Uh, for non-sterile preparations, microbial limits are important to measure and understand and, 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 and conduct in a stability study, as well as preserved products and conducting that preservative effectiveness. I like this particular slide because really different drugs require or may require different test methodologies where conventional one might think of, you know, HPLC conducting with standard uh, diode array detector. But there are many new drugs, different formulations, different matrices, and that really may combine a host of multiple drugs in that same dosage form. So it's more complex. So really there's not any one universal method that would be used for all stability studies, meaning methodology. For instance, we know the theory behind the small molecules, how it works. If it's present, you would probably use an HPLC with some form of a UD detector, uh, most often a photodiode array. But there are many other detection options that one may need to employ or utilize in your stability indicating method such as a fluorescence detector, a refractive index detector. Uh, there are many different types of detectors that can be connected to an HPLC to conduct your study. Now, the large molecules, that's again another selection that would need to be different than the standard traditional HPLC with UV. You look at the theory, you might want to use uh, some of the uh, mass spectrometry with them, and even the activity of the measurement It's important to look at because we know those protein and peptides in the folding. In other words, is that drug, because remember the ultimate goal, is it effective? Is it safe when you're delivering it to that patient? So you're getting back to what is it we're trying to do is provide a safe and effective drug to that patient or medicine when it's compounded and then selecting an appropriate testing method for your stability indicating method. And these are just an example that you may use various different types of testing protocols or methodologies, not protocols, but methodologies. Okay, we've heard the term stability indicating method, and really that's essentially just saying it's a validated method or a procedure that accurately and precisely measures the drug without interference from its impurities, its excipients, and its degradants. So I listed those in order because we often think of degradants, and I spoke of that earlier, but we know that there may be impurities. We know there's related substances. I have a slide with some molecules on them later on that is known related, uh, related compounds or related substances to it. The excipients can, ch can change and can interact with it. So when you're looking at a stability method, it's not just, oh, the active and then it's degrading that active. It, it's its interactions, it's impurities, it's excipients, it's vehicles. Um, an appropriate method should also be chosen based upon the structure 
chemical or biological properties. And so I highlighted that biological because we're seeing more and more of that type of drug substance that's being uh, looked at and utilized in today's uh, world as far as uh, dosage forms. Okay, I can't uh, do a stability talk without some chromatograms as a scientist, but you know, this is a good one that demonstrates for HPLC interferences, it's generally defined as a coelution of peaks or two peaks being detected at the same time. So I wanted to show you, if you didn't look into the grass and so they really blow up that chromatogram, you see you might just initially look at it on the upper right portion of that chromatogram. But if you blow that up, you can see there are peaks hidden in the grass that could contribute to the area under the curve, thus giving you the wrong value or quantitation level. So these are some parabens, ethyl paraben and, and propyl paraben and some other ones that we were looking at. And you can see this diagram nicely illustrates the coelution of peaks. This is not going to be a good stability indicating method. It would not pass mustard. It, could, it should not be utilized. But this is an example that one might miss if they're not looking at the details in a stability indicating method. And then this slide is more of a, it, just as a broad uh, slide, really just showing you, you want to separate the degradant uh, from the, the active. This, we were quantitating EDTA uh, at 15.4, uh, and this is an old, old chromatogram, but it nicely separates if it's going to degrade, and this it did degrade, and you can see it's easily separated, it's easily quantitated, without any effect or this highly resolved, that degradant peak is highly resolved from the peak of interest there. And that this chromatogram demonstrates that. Okay, here's another chromatogram that I really, I, I like to present and often do in, in our talks and that this is a mixture of alprostadil, I think it has probably papaverin and phytolamine in it, in, a, in an appropriate uh, vehicle. but. These chromatograms are not always simple, and you can see it's a pretty, pretty messy uh, chromatogram. But because the concentration of alprostadil is extremely small, several orders of magnitude less than that of the other drug concentrations, that it's important, particularly in those low concentrations. And you can think of maybe T3, T4, fentanyl. I mean, many compounds today that have high potency that you need to be able to separate it out. And that's the importance of testing specifically for that particular active, ensuring that you're not measuring a peak that you don't think you're measuring. So you're, you're seeing and you're looking at that alprostadil peak, very small but highly resolved in this chromatogram from all the other uh, high concentration drug substances in this particular mixture. Okay, so when we say forced degradation, this is performed during that method development. A question is often asked, well, why, why does it cost so much for method development validation, and why is that really the basis of it? Well, you're taking your drug substance and your, and your placebo, which is your drug product without the drug substance, and you're stressing it with heat, with acid, with base, with UV light, and peroxide to create those degradants that would occur naturally should it actually degrade. But if you don't know that, then you have to, you have to do it on every one of those processes. So you're taking all of those, the drug substance and that placebo, which is your drug formula without the, the actives, and you're stressing them under those five conditions, and you're trying to uh, determine and create a degradant to show that if it did degrade in real life, that you could separate it from that drug peak. Okay, so here's an example where we stress the same compound with heat, no change. So, and many times the high heat will cause that molecule to degrade and you'll start seeing some decomposition. But this one, it did not degrade with heat, but it did degrade with the UV. And so this was really nice that the same substance degraded under our, our your proper, appropriate protocol it, where it degraded in UV, but not in a common one that might be heat or humidity. And you can see it did several degradants. 
And notice even that small one right next to the, the chromatogram of, of the interest of peak. And so it's important to resolve those. So if you don't adequately separate it out, you, you won't know that you're, you're getting a contribution of that degradant within that peak of interest. So that's pretty, that's pretty detailed in there from the uh, chromatogram. So this is a good one to demonstrate that. Okay, I mentioned earlier about related substances or related compounds that are mentioned. And you'll look at your monographs and you'll look at the, the USP and it will say test for those related substances, maybe related compound A, related compound B, or even C. Well, those are known impurities that are left over from that manufacturing process that you, you'll need to test for. So in that process, you may not know that, but if it's published, then and you're, let's say you're qualifying the drug substance, then those are important pieces to know. But so it's not, it's not just degradants, but it may be a related impurity that's in your drug substance that is followed through into your drug product when it's compounded. And this is an example of phenylephrine synthesis, uh, and I wanted to show those molecules. Okay, this is a frequently in, uh, shown chromatogram that's been used by many regulatory bodies and, and, and talks, and this, this came from many, many years ago. And essentially, probably it's best to start with the one on the, on the right, that figure two. That chromatogram is really a non-stability indicating method. You might put it on there. It's degraded. You can see it's a, it's a lousy looking chromatogram. It's not, it looks more like a side of a mountain than it does a a slope or something than a chromatogram. But that shows there is a degradant present and it's not resolved. The figure one may be a, a non-stability indicating method before you even get to this point. So here you could have a peak and it looks perfectly fine. You say, oh, fine, no problem. But without knowing a stability indicating, why stressing it, once it's stressed, you can see, oh, that same method produces an extra peak and it's not very, it doesn't look right, it's not appropriate. But then you tweak the method and you further tweak it. Notice in figure three, the bottom left, you further separated the degradant there on the left from the analyte of interest, but it still doesn't look good. And you still see a little carryover and cross-reference and it's not a good baseline. So you need to have that baseline resolution in that chromatogram when you're conducting the stability indicating methods. And then finally, the ideal conditions would be the lower right uh, figure four, which is an example of an appropriate stability indicating method separating well between the two, this, this resolved between the analyte on the right and the degradant. And so this is an example about the effort and time it takes to con develop and validate a stability indicating method. Okay, in the method itself, these are some of the parameters that may be used in a, a method validation. A system suitability, I listed it because even in a routine testing, uh, the USP, FDA, and any analytical method would, would demonstrate for quantitating its active ingredient, a system suitability. And what do we mean by system suitability? This is not to be confused with method suitability in the microbial uh, assays, but the system suitability it includes the resolution, meaning the separation of those peaks. The telling doesn't look like that chromatogram two that we saw previously. And when we say RSD, it's the relative standard deviation. So that's a relative standard deviation calculation um, of repeated measure. So you're taking the same injection six times and then doing that relative standard deviation. And it has to meet a certain criteria. If you're sh injecting the same sample, under the same conditions, same concentration, and you're getting a wide standard deviation, there's something wrong with your system. It's not suitable. And then finally, the column efficiency. So these are parameters that are calculated by your laboratory, whichever laboratory you use, when they're conducting stability or release testing on a routine basis using an HPLC or chromatographic methods. It should include linearity. We know linearity is the concentration over a wide range of uh, the plotting of the calibration of the concentration, varying concentration versus the area under the curve, which is linearity. And we, we talk about that from bracketing, and I'll discuss that in some examples. But it's important to have appropriate linearity 
for the drug product that you are developing a stability indicating method for. And that creates some challenges, especially when you have multiple constituents or multiple actives at varying concentrations at a wide degree. So that's important that you conduct a linearity on your product. And we know precision and accuracy, which are common terms. Remember, precision is how often can you, when you have the same measure, it's repeated measure, precision. So I think if I used to teach this in chemistry class and do a, a target, and you can have a target with, let's, shoot, let's say you th throw the axe. That's a big game right now where everyone's going out and throwing the axes. And you always hit it in the upper right corner where you almost hit it in the same spot all the time where you're precise. You might be precise by hitting that five times that axe and that target, but it's not accurate. But let's say you hit that in the right dead center every time, accurate and precise. But guess what? You hit it five times. You hit it once on the upper left, once in the upper right, once in the lower left, once in the lower right and in the middle. Well, if you average all of those, it's going to be accurate, but it's not going to be precise. So it's really important to consider all these variables and these parameters when you are conducting a study. Ruggedness is very important also. It's showing that you consistently can produce the results with different chemists, different instrumentations. Robustness, that's an important. It's reliable with different changes of that method. Let's say the HPLC you, it's off by a 0.01 mil per minute or something, or the pH is not, let's say, 7, it's 7.01 or 7.2. You know, you're wanting to verify that if there is a change from the ruggedness or robustness, that it is a reliable method that you can count on. And that's the purpose of those validation parameters. Sensitivity, very, very important one is what is the limit of that detection, and which differs than the limit of quantitation. The LOD is very often not the same as the LOQ. It can be, but most important, you have to meet the LOQ, the limit of quantitation. So if you have a low concentration on that calibration curve, you can accurately quantitate that. And then I highlighted specificity because that's really the basis. What we're pushing today is the difference of a bit of a stability indicating method and another perhaps analytical method. You need to stress it using these parameters to show that you could separate out should the degrade the, the, the drug degrade. And they also included the freeze thaw. That's another issue. If you're going to freeze your product and you thaw it, freeze thaw can have an effect on stability of certain chemical entities. So that cannot be ignored. And I added that one too uh, as potential me method validation parameters to consider. <clears throat> All right, what are some of the tests? that are included in the stability uh, study of a sterile injectable. We know we're talking about the assay, which uh, that's just the concentration itself is referred to the assay or the test. Uh, a preservative quantitation, we, it's important to do anti-preservative effectiveness. A coarse pH was demonstrated in 791. And then of course the appearance or the visual inspection and particulate matter, which is both 788 and 789. Some additional tests and stability study for sterile injectables. Of course, you need to do sterility, endotoxin. These are, of course, in 71 and 85. And then the preservative effectiveness, which you're seeing a tremendous interest in the last two bullets here in this slide, both preservative effectiveness and con container closure integrity. And I really like this idea of the container closure integrity because just imagine you have a sterile product, you start out, but there's some type of a uh, an issue with that container and you're able to it, it the, the integrity from a microbial perspective is compromised well that's demonstrating a problem with that integrity of it or another issue is even uh, a, a interaction and I'll talk about that shortly too absorption and le uh, uh, extractables and leachables and even absorption but container closure is a very important uh, test that probably became more, there was a lot more interest in this particular one in the last, I'd say, 10 years in the compounding industry. Okay, accelerated data. That's a very important uh, uh, piece of stability, and that's basically all we mean by accelerated is storing those samples at higher temperatures. So instead of 25 degrees C, you may be doing 40 degrees C. 
Uh, you're doing it at a higher temperature, so you're trying to stress it. You're trying to get some data earlier on. So basically, accelerated studies provide that data for temperature excursions. Let's say you store it and you have a problem and in in your, your uh, refrigerator goes out or you're, you're, uh, if you're in a hot day and, and, or the drug is shipped and there's a problem. That would give you an indication. And that's, again, the purpose of doing that heat humidity uh, parameter. It does not provide that conclusive stability data, and it's critical that you conduct the stability study utilizing the actual intended storage conditions. But it's not uncommon, and I think it's a good one to uh, to maybe ex do a short accelerated, and just to say, is it going to degrade? You know, even we see a formulation that that these two areas. When people say, how do you cut down the cost? The worst thing to do is conduct a study and then realize, oh, we got problems in the last stage, you know, last date or the last time point. So any kind of a preliminary data through literature or for common knowledge or discussion with fellow colleagues or accelerated studies or even uh, formulating your batch, ensuring that it's, it's stable physically and, and it's not falling out, any of that can help you and save money long term. And your lab, regardless who you utilize, should be, will be able to help you with those uh, that that data and th those uh, terminologies or that that system or process or approach would be a better way to to say it. So talk to your lab partner with your laboratory regarding conducting these studies, and they'll help give some uh, regular uh, referral to the appropriate regulatory guidance and and uh, documents that can assist in conducting that stability study. So what are some of the criteria to consider when assigning this? Now I even draw deeper into it. So instead of doing, we're talking about the test, now we're actually talking about what is it you should consider when looking at the BUD as we just brought up, that drug and its degradation mechanisms. What is that dosage form and is it components appropriate for those dosage forms? Does it have a potential for microbial proliferation or growth? Is the container in which the preparation is, it, is packaged? Um, what are the expected storage conditions? I know there were some really good talks given and I'll, uh, by USP and members of the USP refer, uh, Expert Committee and industry recently on these topics. And I, th I think, and I'll give some references uh, through some later slides, but those intended duration of therapy and the conditions at which it's going to be stored is very important. So looking now even deeper, look at those formulation dosage forms. You're going to look at that drug. You're going to look at the concentration and the excipient and vehicle. And I wanted to bring that topic because I remember uh, oxytocin with lactated ringers or, uh, you know, the oxytocin in another IV bag, uh, saline, dextrose. By change of the vehicle, it can alter or accelerate the degradant of that active ingredient. So the excipients and or the vehicle can react with the drug substance to increase that uh, degradation or decrease the stability shelf life of that product. Again, why it's so important to look at the entire formulation, dosage form in regards to its concentration excipients or vehicles. The container closures we were just discussing and then those storage conditions are very critical does it need to be in the light or no light? I have a good diagram or a plot that I, I presented to here. Okay, now let's look at some other even more important as we keep getting deeper into this, uh, looking at the analysis of this uh, substance as we're doing the testing on. So dosage forms affect, these factors affect the stability, particle size. It will affect the emulsions and the suspension. As we talked about earlier, it's not uncommon if the pH is off, and we see this several times where it will fall out of solution. So that solubility we know from the old henderson hasselbalch equation definitely will affect that solubility of that product. So that needs to be aware of those. What is that solvent system composition? Even the compatibility of some of the anions and cations, and not just the cations and anions compatibility, but even the strength of that of the ionic strength, the solution itself is important. That primary container, and then are there chemical additives? Is there molecular binding occurring? Is there diffusion of the drugs and excipients that's crossing over? 
So there's a lot of factors that's going to affect in those dosage forms. As you're beginning to look at, we know for, for years, the uh, extended release uh, products, but even now with rapid uh, release or um, rapid dissolving tablets, I think you're seeing a host of new drug delivery mechanisms that are out there, and you'll see that also in the future, which present challenges both from the compounding perspective and the analytical perspective. Okay, this is another good question that we, we get on a fairly regular basis about extractables and leachables. And so I thought uh, 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 they're taken from USP 1663 and 1664. But that extractable is a compound that can be extracted from the container closure itself when in the presence of a solvent, whereas a leachable it's that compound that's leaching into that drug product formulation from the container as a result of a direct contact with the formulation. An example of a leachable I've seen has been um, some of the inks, where the ink would might be uh, leached out from that container into that product on, on early on many years ago. I, I saw that. And then absorption. So as you're looking at extractables and leachables, we also should consider, are you losing some of the drug itself because it's being absorbed by the package, decreasing the concentration? And we've seen that. So some of the storage conditions affecting those stabilities are obviously those temperature or, or their excursion. And again, the light, heat, humidity, and carbon dioxide, and even the packaging components. Those are all listed in the USP Chapter 1191 and should be considered in those stability. I like this particular uh, diagram because it shows we plotted the degradant over a 40-week period. And traditionally, you're just taking that excipient, and we were trying to see what is the percent loss of degradant over time. And this is of, of, of an excipient, TC6, on, a, on an active drug, and we plotted that. Okay, so you start seeing where it's coming on after the 10-week period. But notice it actually starts even earlier. And what we do, you go back and you plot it. This particular one is a plot of the degradant divided by the concentration of the API, both for the light and dark. Uh, so it's the ratio of the degradant over the API in both light and dark conditions. So you can see this one product very clearly light causes degradation, but even you're getting some degradant in the stored position at, at that's exceeding the guideline. But you really couldn't see it, so you really started doing that plotting out. So I think a picture often or a graph uh, illustrates more information sometimes, and this was a good uh, project, uh, so I wanted to indicate that. Okay, water activity. This has been a very, um, this topic has been discussed a lot lately. And I wanted to probably, I should have put second bullet first and then the first one second, but really water activity, measuring that water activity is important. Why? Because many drug products include water in their formulations and they're sensitive to water exchanges and the environment. But, but how does that work? Well, it really works by that water and that drug product is free, that is freely available to participate in reactions such as hydrolysis or provide environment that supports microbial growth. So, we know that microbial growth needs nutrients and, and temperature and time and, and, uh, and, 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 and liquid. And so that measurement of water activity is presented in a chart in USP 1112. And it's also being utilized in the 795. And so there's a lot of questions that came on it. And it basically 795 on the proposed is elaborating on the role of the water activity in determining the beyond use state limits for preparation. But I like particularly 11, uh, Table 1 of USP 1112 because it lists those water activity values that are required to support the growth of the microorganisms. But look at that 0.61 of, uh, of fungi. It, so you can see at differing levels of water activity, the greater the water activity it's required to grow Pseudomonas. But it doesn't take a lot there for that fungus, but it does need those other uh, appropriate conditions. <clears throat> so thus the basis for the introduction of water activity.
that's being listed and being utilized today in USP 795. So presently, the maximum BUD in the absence of stability information is broken out into non-aqueous formulations at six months. Um, not The BUD is not later than the time remaining until the earliest expiration date of API or six months. I don't want to just read these to you, but presently, they're broken up into non-aqueous formulations, um, water-containing formulations, which of course has a smaller amount, 14 days, and then water-containing topical dermal or mucosal or semi-solid formulations, which get even a larger amount of time of 30 days. But let's look at really the proposed, because part of this discussion was to look at some of the proposed revisions. And these next four, five, six, seven slides, eight slides, ever how many, I actually got them from the USP um, site, and they had a stakeholder forum meeting, and they really, there's some good, I would encourage you to go to that site, pick it up, and then you can download those PDFs or those uh, talks, and I think they're very, very good. They were presented good, they were excellent speakers, and, and, and I thought that was good, so I pulled some slides from them and then referenced uh, their, them appropriately. So this was the USP 795 proposed revision, and this is the beyond use state limits by the type of preparation in the absence of the compounded preparation monograph or a compounded non-sterile specific stability information. So if you don't have a monograph or you don't have information, and it's broken out into essentially aqueous dosage forms and non-aqueous dosage forms. And again, you see how they're defining. They're defining aqueous dosage forms as a, as a, a substance there that aqueous dosage forms that has an, a water activity equal to or greater than 0 0.6. And I think that also has been changed recently in the new proposed. And those, this should be the reflected the right, uh, right equal to and or greater than. Whereas non-aqueous dosage forms are less than 0 0.6 water activity. So looking at this chart, it's, it's important then the aqueous dosage forms are broken down into the non-preserved aqueous dosage forms and the preserved. And you can see under the conditions. So for instance, a non-aqueous dosage form, such as a capsule or a tablet or something, that is has a water activity less than 0.6 in the absence of a compounded preparation or monograph or information, when stored at controlled room temperatures or refrigerator, you can get 180 days. So this was a good, um, I thought this was one of the, this was the 795 uh, taken from this uh, particular presentation. And then in general, it, it's, it's talking about the, uh, in the presence of the compounded uh, non-sterile, the BUD may be expanded up to a maximum of the uh, 180 days. Uh, stability indicating methods are required. I, I, but I, I guess the part I wanted to also indicate was the bracketing can be utilized to provide some flexibility. That question. Also, another point that's brought out in the proposed 795s is these are just a few of the bullets that was taken from some of those uh, presentations is the uh, for the stakeholder meetings was the preservative intent uh, the antimicrobial effectiveness being conducted for those non sterile uh, compounded products as well. Okay. The um, storage period for 797, this is in the absence of sterility testing, and this is presently. So presently, we have the low, medium, and high, and then under the new proposed, you're going to see the category one, two, and three. So in the absence of the passing of sterility test and beyond new data, beyond use data, the following storage periods cannot be ex uh, exceeded. So this graph is, is clearly communicating to you an existing medium uh, category in a refrigerated would be nine days. And so this, you can see the risk process, the higher, the lower amount of time, the higher the risk, the lower amount of time that's given for its BUD. <coughs> Excuse me. 
All right, this is uh, under UST 797 proposed revisions. And again, that category one is uh, a compounded sterile product, which has the shortest BUD made in a segregated, unclassified uh, compounded area. And you're seeing the under control conditions less than 12 hours and refrigerated 24. Whereas con currently the official 797 is low risk in that compounded uh, that uh, sterile product in a segregated compounded area is 12 hours. Again, it's taken from this particular presentation for the reference. Category two, and what we mean by the category two is that uh, con category two CSPs have a longer BUD and they must be prepared in the clean room. And we know all the, all the next slide I'll be talking about is category three, which are those that may be assigned even a longer BUD then the category one or two, and they may even go up to 180 days if additional requirements are met. But let's let's take this in a logical fashion. So here we have category two. The compounded, they are aseptically processed and no sterility test is performed. Notice they're prepared from only starting sterile starting components. You get four days and, and control 10, for refrigerator and then 45 for the freezer. Presently or currently official again is that low and medium. Okay, then the next slide I'm actually showing a high risk compounded to, but it's talking about the high risk. So you're seeing a high risk and then that other is the medium and low risk. So this is a category two uh, CSP for aseptically processed where no sterility test is performed but it's prepared from one or more non-sterile starting materials, and thus you have a lower amount, one day, four days, and 45 respective with the appropriate temperatures as you see here. Okay, and then this particular slide, you're sort of building up, this sort of, sort of summarizes it uh, nicely. I think it's, it's taking that um, 797 pr uh, proposed revisions in category two, is it's a, if your method is you're aseptically processing it, and let's say, let's look at the, yes, you do perform sterility tests. Under controlled room temperature, you get 30 days. So this particular slide, I think, is it gives a lot of information in a short amount of time, but it's a good slide as well. It sort of summarizes and builds upon it. But notice, termally sterilized, that is compound of sterile products, that do pass the sterility test, they have instead of 14 days, they get 45, 60, and 90 respectively. Now, notice going up to category three, termally sterilized, sterility tested, passing all applicable tests for category three, you can get up to 180 days in the freezers or 120 days in the refrigerator or 90 days. Again, notice the difference between the aseptically processed, sterility tested, and passing all applicable tests for that category three of the CSPs versus the termally sterilized. You're getting more uh, dating according to the proposed revisions in the new 797. Okay, some basic, uh, I pulled a few bullets out, which I think was also presented in those previous uh, presentations, category three. Some of they undergo sterility testing, supplemented by endotoxin testing when applicable, and they have more requirements in the category two for personnel, qualifications, sterile garbing, frequent of, of applying those four cycle disinfectants, increased uh, environmental monitoring and stability determination. So ultimately what they're doing is you're mitigating some of that risk by increasing some of the, that quality by design and building that in in that process. And so you can see the thought process that went, was undergone in developing these categories and this risk. There's also a proposed revision of a batch size uh, for all CSPs requiring sterility testing must be limited to 250 final yield units. Okay, the multi-dose uh, CSP, very important. A multi-dose must be prepared by that category two. I think when we get down, I'm getting short on time, it's really important for preserved aqueous multi-dose that antimicrobial effectiveness, which is USP51, be conducted. It has to be conducted, and of course, that's the purpose of the 
preservative effectiveness is to measure, is it still effective throughout the life of the time of the product that's being administered? Again, you, there's some tables there in table 11 and table 12, which is category two and three respectively. That's listed in there for the proposed 797. Okay, let's look at some of the basic guidelines. I wanna get down with some practical examples. So 503A, the, uh, the 503A, these are some guidance from the uh, FDA, you see there on the right, the revision of the citation, but basically the preparations that are compounded, they're in compliance with USP, they're using approved bulk substances, either the USP monographs or substances that have been approved by the FDA. Now let's look at a 503B stability, expiration dating. There's a lot of guidance being given by the, the uh, FDA now on a 503B. 503B is a, usually a higher volume, it's more GMP-like, and so these are some, if you see a continuum from a 503A to a 503B to a full GMP pharmaceutical product that's been, is, uh, went through the FDA process with the full clinical trials and, and, and manufacturing at a pharmaceutical company, Big Pharma. For, so for a 503B, stability expiration dating is that program must be established. It must be used to determine the appropriate storage or expiration date, expiration date meaning the stability or BUD for a 503B. Commercial product will use, often use the term expiration date, whereas a compounded product will often use the beyond use date. Both of them are stability. Products must retain its quality and again remain it sterile throughout the expiration date, similar to what it started out with on the initial, uh, one of the first slides. Again, assigning that, the agency does not intend to take action against an outsourcing facility regarding stability if a BUD has been established according to the criteria. And we talk about that, the BUD providing reasonable assurance of chemical and physical stability, and the BUD is used at that expiration date. Some more guidance that's listed. Uh, if terminally sterilized and no sterility testing, BUD is not more than 14 days. If aseptically processed with no sterility testing, again, you see that not more than 24 hours, not more than three days for refrigerated, and then 45 days. But you see the trend, a day at controlled temperatures, three days for refrigerator, 40, 45 days for frozen. So you can see the, the greater uh, the thought process as you're going along, which you follow along in the other guidance documents. And then again, if a batch has completed sterility test before the release, the BUD may be extended beyond that date of the test completion. And that's also listed for you here. Uh, that test, the stability test must be reliable, must be meaningful and specific. That procedure, it needs to be performed on the same final product container and labeling. So this is more in line and this gets to that container closure uh, issue that we discussed earlier. Testing samples must be representative and selected from the same lot or batch. Again, samples must be representative of the batch and stored under the same conditions. It needs to be incorporated into microbial effectiveness and it uses three batches and, and you'll see that in it. If it's composed of one or more drug products approved under the 505, B, 505 of FDC, uh, the drug product label specifies how to assign it. So I, there's no need to read through these, but I wanted to provide the information because we often get questions between the 503A requirements and the 503B. Again, 503B in use time uh, is defined here. I want to get to the last couple of minutes, the actual, uh, some injectable, sterile injectable solutions. These are examples. So this would be a stability study. Questions are often asked, can the lab help us with that design? Yes, they can and they do and they should. Uh, ultimately, it's the, the, the compounder, the, the person who's making the drug that's responsible for that data. But your lab will have the knowledge and the experience and the help and based upon the guidance documents that can help you. But this is a sterile injectable aqueous solution with a preservative, and so it's going to be a visual test. You see at each time point, there's five time points, and this is often asked, well, how do you do it? How do you set it up? And so we've given some examples. We're conducting the pH, so you're seeing the method type. <clears throat> you notice the time points. Here with the preservative, we measured both the active, the ascorbic acid, and the benzyl alcohol, which is your preservative. We're doing the benzyl alcohol by GC, and you're doing it at the respective time points. 
focus thus five days. Notice the sterilities then at 0, 90, and 180. And then notice the endotoxin and antimicrobial effectiveness. I saw in some of the guidance documents that said 180. I always believe that one should do times zero, not just the end, because if it wasn't preservative at the beginning, it gives you some of the basis of it. So I think for a line, you need to have two points, just not one point. So we suggest antimicrobial effectiveness to be done both zero and at the end. Okay, here's a CGMP stability study design example of a methylcobalamine, one milligram per mil. It's a parenteral injectable. It's a multiple dose. It's in an amber vial with five mil fill. It's stored under refrigerated conditions. And notice, because it's that CGMP, stability study design for 503B, it has three lots. And again, we're doing it 0, 30, 60, 90 days. So at each time point, you're conducting all of those appropriate tests. These tests are listed for you here. You see methylcobalamin, which is the assay. That's the active. But notice the particulate matter that was been added in addition to the benzyl alcohol, which is your preservative. Sterility, endotoxin, and then we're even doing that antimicrobial effectiveness test, the 51 at the beginning and the end. And then, of course, we've added the container closure integrity. So these are some examples, real-life examples, of a study design for various stability studies for both 503A and 503B of practical examples. And I would encourage you to ask your laboratory, whichever one you use, some help and assistance in that. These are some basic lists and references, and the guidance that we had given to you earlier are also listed. And this is a picture of when I went to Machu Picchu a few years ago. And Amy, do we have time for even one question? Let me see what questions we have. And we'll, um, we know this is an important topic, and we've kind of gone past time, but we do want to make sure that we do have some time for questions. Um, let's see here. Okay, uh, let me see. Do we have a going down, Amy, with some because there's a lot of questions. But I, what we probably ought to do is pull the questions out since it's already the time, and then try to answer them. Uh, is there a 0.6 aqueous dosage form for 503B? Do you have stability information for non-sterile? There's a lot of specific questions. I tell you what we'll do since we wouldn't. Uh, there's a lot of questions, and and the time is allotted. What we'll do, is this possible, Amy, for us to get the questions that's been given to us from the audience and then uh, reply, put it together, and then send it out to the recipients or to the attendees? Yes, we can do that. So um, continue putting your questions here for the next 30 seconds or so. You also have Dr. Cupic's um, email address. That's T Cupic, K U P I E C at A-R-L-O-K dot com. We will take all of the questions submitted throughout this Q&A and we'll follow up with a document that will have the question listed and the answer. Um, so we will have that to all the attendees. Also to one hour following this session, you will receive an email and that will include a copy of the slides. It will include a recording link and also the evaluation link. They wanted you to type his email. Uh, yes. Could you type it for him? Uh, it's I'll put it in the chat, chat. for the audience. Thank you very much for your time. We we appreciate it. And uh, we know this is an important topic, so we want to make sure we get you all the information that we can. Thank you. Oh.